All right. So I am so happy, honored, blessed to have Dr. Lorraine Matter with me today. Thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. And my big goal today is I want to lend some calm to everybody. It's getting crazy out there. So the big goal today is to get everybody to calm down a little bit, but let's arm them with some knowledge. I want them to feel when they're done with this, when they're watching us, that they have a little bit more. They've been reading a lot of stuff on the internet and a lot of stuff is some just crazy off the wall stuff. Somebody wrote on the internet, if you just drink water, warm water every 15 minutes, that's going to, that's going to kill the virus. There's some craziness out there. Everybody's running for toilet paper. So, <laughs> yes. you know, it, if you yeah. own, if you own toilet paper now, you, you know, you, you, you <laughs> own gold. Um, and, and it's not even like diarrhea is one of the symptoms. That's a, that's a maybe symptom of this, you know? And of course, everybody's worried about being quarantined in the house, can't get out. Um, and everybody's buying clean supplies. So in this hysteria that's happening, you know, a lot of people feel that it is just being moved to start by social media, by the news. But, you know, they have a, a goal to deliver what's going on outside. I want to deliver them some calm today. And I know you've had experience as well in dealing with these type of medical scenarios. So today I wanna to get rid of some of the craziness and get some truth behind what we can do. So can you share with us about the coronavirus? Cause there's different types of coronavirus that's out there. It's not new, but this one is new. Right, the coronavirus has been around for a long time, but then they mutate. And the, one of the famous ones was SARS. So I was the chief medical officer of Prudential when SARS broke out and I had to formulate a response for the whole company. And it's not so different from what we're doing now. Then MERS came out and now it's COVID-19. So, you know, each virus has its own character personality, so to speak. The, 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 the reason why people are panicking so much is because it's spreading fast. Maybe it's not as, it, it seems to be more severe than the flu, but a lot of that may be due to the fact that we're not testing. We're not testing a lot of people. So as you test the number of ill, the number of symptomatic will decrease. Right now, the global death rate is 4% or 5%. And I just calculated the US death rate, it's 2%. But we have to keep in mind that 80% of the people don't even have symptoms. They don't have symptoms at all. So even if you do come in contact with someone with the coronavirus or you've touched a contaminated surface and touched your face, 80%, you're not even gonna know it. 15% had mild symptoms. And as a matter of fact, my husband just sent me a clip of someone on who was interviewed on CNN and she said she had you know mild symptoms of you know cough uh, she had some muscle aches and you know she didn't even know it was the coronavirus until she found out that several friends at the same party came down with the same symptoms and she was she had a flu test and at the time they were also testing for the coronavirus and she learned long past her illness was done that indeed she did have the coronavirus and her words to everybody is don't panic it, it this too shall pass it's like the cold it's like the flu the people who really have to worry are the old and people with very bad chronic illnesses okay like the immunosuppressed folks Exactly. If you're on chemotherapy and you're on prednisone, of, of course, this is good. I'm sorry. Can you see me? Uh, something just popped up. There are so many pop-ups coming up. I tried to <laughs> eliminate these notifications. So, um, you know, people don't even know they have it. 5% of people are going to experience serious symptoms. And be careful if you're on immunosuppressants like Humira and Embrel and prednisone and chemotherapeutic agents, or if you have some you know, chronic COPD, chronic obst obstructive pulmonary disease, you have respiratory illnesses, kidney failure, things like that. Those are the people you should run, not walk, if you become symptomatic to your local hospital. And always be aware, be cognizant of other people. Let, let them know in advance. 
my hospital, if you call them in advance, they're going to isolate you, they're going to test you, and then they're, they're going to confirm. But 80% have nothing. 15% it's mild and it will pass and survivors are getting going on CNN telling people not to panic. They're living proof that it's you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. So why, in your opinion, because I remember when you know SARS was around, I mean, I don't remember the the panic and the travel bans to, you know, everyone buying toilet paper and you know, paper towels and cleaning supplies. I just don't, I don't recall that. What, was it of that nature when, when SARS was around? It was, but you have to realize there's, there wasn't big social media at the time. We didn't have as many 24 seven news stations at the time. People are fo too focused on it. I, I tell people take a news fast. I mm -hmm. took a news fast three, three years ago. It's not like I don't follow the news. It's right. not like I'm putting my head in the sand. But if you stay glued to the TV and to social media looking for the answer, you're only going to get into more of a panic. And I think part of it is the information age. And this virus is spreading a little bit more rapidly because people didn't take measures. Yes, we had travel bans then. And anyone who was coming back from affected areas was asked to go home, stay home for two weeks, do not come in. These things were not implemented right away. They were told not to come into the office. I was the one who had to clear everyone. I had them take their temperature every day and then I would clear them. We would actually disable their badges so that we just let them know, don't come in contact with anybody. You know, and, and that's great to know because I, I don't think that's not written about on the internet, right? No, nobody knows that you know, when SARS came around, this is what you guys were actually doing because everybody's like, this is worse than anything else. So now we hear and they write all the time that the flu has killed more people, as we know every year. So this year, the flu vaccine was effective for 45% effective for adults. There's only 55% effective for you know, children, but there's no vaccine for this. They say the flu kills more people, but I think in this setting, if you can talk about how this is actually different from the flu, because this is not the flu, this is something different. Right, the flu has a very sudden onset, usually higher fevers, headache, cough, muscle aches. This, the prodrome is, they call it a prodrome. What leads up to the illness is a lot slower. So people are not really, am I sick? Am I not sick? Uh, they feel a little off then in, in a few days and they might get a headache, they might get a fever, they might get muscle aches, they might get diarrhea. And in others, after that prodrome of a few days, somebody is actually chronicling his Ill illness. He's a doctor chronicling it on Twitter day by day while he's home in isolation. So there is a little bit slower lead up to the flu, but what the reaction is, is when you really get into the flu full blown illness, it releases what they call cytokines, which are like a chemical bomb. And it's not in everybody. Everybody's cytokine response, that's the chemical messengers that recruit your immune system. It's not always severe. So who is it severe in? Who is it not severe in? It tends to be in people whose immune system is compromised or has severe underlying illnesses. So that is how it differs from the flu and that it's, uh, we don't know if you can't really make an accurate comparison because the flu people are tested for the flu people know the flu is around the testing has been spotty we don't have widespread testing so that's why it seems like it's much more fatal and it's much more severe because there's not there's we're not testing the asymptomatic people we're only testing people in the beginning who came from affected areas or who had full-blown symptoms this woman was staying at home, the one who's on CNN telling everybody, don't panic, I survived. She was on CNN saying she, she never even dreamed it was the coronavirus. It was only after the illness was almost over that she realized she had it and it passed. And was she exposed through travel? Was she somewhere else or just about town? She was at a party. She was at a party. So you don't know where people are coming from. You don't know where people have been. 
You know, a few weeks ago, my, my husband panicked when somebody shook his hand because they had come back from Taiwan. Taiwan wasn't hit, but I watched him like a hawk for two weeks. He's fine. I'm fine. You know, the big thing now is it's allergy season. I have post-nasal drip and I'm constantly clearing my throat. I keep ha having to tell people I've washed my hands. I've disinfected everything. This is allergies. That's the greatest fear is that, you know, you're going to go somewhere, you sneeze and people are going to panic. Right. Right. So I want to talk a little bit about isolation because the person who's quarantined in a house, right? So what tips can you offer the other people that are in the house for that person's quarantine? Because sometimes, you know, you have a cold, you're going to hang out on the sofa, you'll hang out in front of TV. But this time, shouldn't you pretty much be truly quarantined, like up in your room and stay there and let's go to separate places? Yes, I would say stay in, stay in a separate place, wash anything you come in contact with, don't share utensils, disinfect anything you've touched, you know, even, even eat separately from, from others. Because... They, they did a study between China after they implemented isolation. What they did with infected cases was they put them in isolation. They didn't put them back in the families because the families, then the families got infected and then they all ended up, you know, having to get health care and to an already stressed health care system once they started putting people in isolation. So in your home, you can self isolate in your own home and make sure you, you limit your contact. And if you're gonna get up and share a bathroom with somebody, put a mask on when you go to the bathroom. Only the person who's sick needs a mask. Okay, let's Only talk about that real right. fast. The, the mask, because people are buying, you know, like we talked about briefly before we started, you know, the respirator masks, and they're taken away from professionals who probably actually need the respirator mask. If they have facial hair, that's gonna be a problem. The respirator mask needs to be actually fitted for the individual. I mean, what, why they should be buying masks. No, and, and they're not to be had, you know, so that's why if you're going to go to get checked out, if you're going to go to a doctor's office and you're coughing or sneezing, then you put a mask on, but you shouldn't be wearing a mask in your house. So you shouldn't, you don't necessarily, if you're in public and you're six feet away from somebody, you don't need to be wearing a mask. People are keeping their distance. You know, we're, we're elbow bumping now. Everybody's elbow bumping. Um, just... The, the, the hardest thing though, Michael, is to not touch your face. Right. I'm educating people not to touch the face because it goes through your eyes, your nose and your mouth. And you know, how many people are on the computer and then they rub their eyes or they're just, you know, doing this. I All the time. I didn't touch. So it's, it's a habit and it's unconscious. But just saying it, I want to scratch my face right now. I got an itch on the left side of my face. So we we're going to have itches. Tissue. Let me tell you, this is what so we grab it. We grab a tissue. What you do? You grab the tissue. You do that, and then you throw it away. Gotcha. So that's everybody should be having buying, tissues around. That's right? probably we're buying so much toilet paper because they're using that instead of tissues and everything else. And it can be transmitted. They call it the oral fecal route. Whereas if it can, some people can get a mild diarrhea and it's in your stool. And if you don't wash your hands and you touch your face, it gets in. And if you touch somebody else's foods or utensils and they, they can transmit it. So that's just it, wash your hands. And, I, and they did a comparison of the CDC method of washing the hands and the World Health Organization. And it's, it's quite different. So I always like to show people how to do it. You wanna, you want to rub your hands together, soap it up really well, go inside between the fingers on this side and rub the back of your hands. You're going to go on this side and rub the back of your hands. You're going to go like this. You're going to do your thumbs. You're going to do the tips of your fingers and, you know, do the full walk and then rinse off. I've been using, because I'm, even my hands are getting a little bit dry and they're never dry. I usually have fish oil and I tell people you can get silky smooth skin from the inside out. And I, I done it with fish oil and I've never had to use lotion. I, I've always washed my hands a lot. Uh, I'm using a soap by, that's made with essential oils. And I'm also using a, an a organo soap. It has some 
reishi mushroom in it and it has aloe vera so then it's not drying and it does the trick soap and water does the trick the hand sanitizers are when you're out and about and you can get to soap and water so they're selling out but i've been using young living thieves oil and diluting it and i just carry a little bottle around in my purse and i can use it both as a disinfectant for anything i touch as well as on my hands and I, you know, I use regular lotion if I, if my hands get too dry. Alcohol is pretty drying, but that's why they, you know, mix it with aloe vera gel. But you can use any kind of hand cream after you wash. So wash your hands like you're going to prepare for surgery. Yeah. Right, like you're, like you're going to do surgery. Um, and then use, you know, a good type of uh, a hand lotion. Um, you talked about thieves. I love the smell of thieves. I diffuse it in the office all the time. So... If you can share it with everybody what actually thieves is because some people are like what what, you, what is thieves what is a thief it's Nobody a mix knows. of thieves. essential oils and a lot of the oils you know i you can't make claims about it because the cdc only approves certain things bleach kills bleach kills the things sure. on the surfaces but you, you know you don't want to bleach your hands you know you don't want to bleach there are certain things you just don't want to put bleach on lysol brand name and there's probably others that are generics of Lysol, Purell, which is a hand wash. Those are the ones that are approved by the CDC. But essential oils in and of themselves, a lot of them have antiseptic and disinfectant properties. Can I make a claim that it's gonna kill the coronavirus? No, not really, I can't. I can't make that claim, but the more oils you have as a mixture, because the Purell and the these hand sanitizers have been building super bugs because it's the same thing. Whereas when you have a mix of things, this is why when there was antibiotic resistance to different bacteria, you use two or three different kinds of antibiotics because it lessens the chance of being resistant to one. So when you use a multitude of essential oils, you're less likely to get a resistance, or Got so it. we think. These, these are sort of general principles. Can I prove it? No, but it's the best you could do right now. But soap and water, soap and water works. Uh, on fabric, the virus doesn't last as long, but on hard surfaces, it can last up to nine days. So everybody and his brother sending out emails, we're disinfecting, even the New York City subways are, <laughs> People told me they're cleaner than they've ever been. So you can't be you can't be too careful. And you know, even if you did touch a surface that was infected or contaminated, if you don't touch your face, you're not gonna. It's not gonna go through your skin. It's gonna okay. go through your eyes, your nose, or your mouth. Okay. Now. One of our uh, people watching right now, Howard Kuhlman, he asked, have you heard of chloroquine? And I think that was part of the article you put up with the zinc. Is that correct? Yes. In South Korea, they started, and I can't, I can't say they're going to use it in the U.S. It's still experimental, and there are a lot of regulations of what you can and cannot do. But what they did in Korea was they also isolated people. They didn't put them back in their homes to infect other people. They put them in isolation centers. So they really cut down, they didn't double like Spain and Italy and, and what we were seeing because they acted fairly quickly. And everybody talks about zinc and what this article, not the article, but the video that I, I posted shows that zinc needs to get into the cells to stop replication of the virus. Now, it can't easily get into the cells. So chloroquine, which was used for malaria or hydroxychloroquine, opens the portals to let the zinc get into the cells. And that's what they used in South Korea. And they found that it really made a difference. Whether it, it's not as big a study or as big a trial as what would be, you know, quote unquote, approved, uh, approved protocol, but it's something to think about. But when you say made a difference, is that made a difference that it shortened the length of time somebody was experiencing the symptoms or preventative? Because you're not going to talk about prevention. So how did it help no, you most? Wouldn't give, you wouldn't give something like that for prevention. 
you you give it if they have symptoms. You know, so, you also have to be careful who you give it to. It it does something they call it lengthened CQT intervals on EKG. That means that it, your heart can go into rhythm disturbance if you already have a prolonged QT interval or if you have gotcha. a, a tendency. So you're not going to just give this to anybody. Zinc you can take. How effective it's going to be? I don't know. When I did my research, I didn't seem to see that this was the thing. Um, but the isolation measures have been around since a long time. You know, they realized that in the 1918, when they had that flu that killed millions of people, well, you know what? That's because they went to parades, they had large gatherings. That's why they're, they're you know, they're taking the absolute best public health measures, hand washing, social distancing, decreasing your exposure to a lot of people. And then now many counties have stepped up and they're closing schools. And even my husband, even though my husband's workplace, there has not been anybody who's been infected. They're just telling everybody to work from home. So if you have that opportunity to work from home, you have less exposure. It's a numbers game. Okay. So I want to go back to zinc again, because zinc is something I use. I'm pretty sure you use zinc as well. Yeah. Um, you know, is there a better delivery system for zinc? I mean, other than taking, you know, regular zinc. I didn't really research that, but the liposomal forms of many things seem to penetrate the, the cells better and they cross the blood brain barrier. But I, as I said, I didn't really research that to death. When I did the research, I, I wrote an article for my newsletter and my list and I put it in a blog. Uh, I picked out the things that showed a little bit more efficacy. Mm -hmm. I think zinc has always been used and I'm not right. saying don't take zinc and I think I, I'm still taking some zinc, but, you know, having adequate levels of vitamin D, boosting your immune system, taking beta glucan, which you shouldn't take if you have an autoimmune disorder, vitamin C, which really hasn't been proven, but it does, it seems to shorten the course of colds and flus, but it doesn't doesn't really prevent. So having it in your system is not a bad thing and it's not harmful uh, unless you take super high doses and have a kidney disorder. You know, zinc was sort of plus minus when it came to the list. And yes. N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine is, it has some antibacterial properties and breaks through mucus and biofilms. Yeah, NAC, NAC is great for the whole, you know, respiratory and all that. I mean, I think it's absolutely wonderful for that. So, I mean, I'm using, and we'll, we'll talk about it. So now let's change our conversation to, you know, we got people to lend some calm. So everyone's not going to panic and we're going to be more prepared than panic. So let's use the P for prepared and P for panic, right? Yeah. So that we'll use that. And then we'll talk about how we can actually improve our immune system. So I have been working on really hard not always great at it is sleep. So yeah. I've been trying to get to bed at least an hour before, you know, I normally get. So I usually only sleep about six hours. I'm trying to shoot for seven. So I'm working on sleep. Um, I don't do any, I don't read from a Kindle or anything like that. So I have my blue light exposure is really, really very low at nighttime before I go to bed. Um, just got to pull away from reading and then go to sleep. So sleep is super important. So can you talk about sleep a little bit and why it's important for our immune system? Well, that's when you recover, you rejuvenate and you repair, you know, your, your hormone system is affected a lot by sleep. And so is your immune system and your nervous system and your nervous system. If, if you're not sleeping, your nervous system's in high gear and it shuts down your immune system. You need, you need all of them to work together in balance. And that's why sleep, meditation, relaxation, uh, eating healthy, all of these things are really important. Now you wrote a kick-ass article. Thank you. I, I love what you wrote because we think alike and i i couldn't have written it better and i love that you brought humor into it Thanks. because i i watch these little skits that make me laugh i because if you stay focused on the news and the the sky is falling your nervous system is going to be in high alert then it's going to turn on your cortisol which is the stress hormone that's going to depress your immune system it's also going to keep you awake at night and it's a downward spiral so humor breaks through all of that. And that's what I love about you, Michael. Thank you. I do. a great sense of humor. I, it, it, and it was fun to write. You know, it's just, I was reading all this stuff online. I'm going, this is, it's getting crazy. So if we can laugh, we can smile a little bit, then then I, I did my job. And 
you know, don't don't job. don't lick doorknobs, right? Don't, don't. Yeah, I love it. And you know, you did you did such a great job with that, and everything that you put in that article was relevant. And I agree with it. It's check, check, Thanks. check, check. <laughs> so you know, I should be interviewing you at that stuff. Well, you know, one thing I want to talk about is like where people are getting their information from, right? So that's oh, another yeah. thing. So, you know, they hear a blog or some health person or some personality person. I want to be as politically correct and polite as I possibly can be. You know, I want people to stick to people who kind of know what they're talking about and people who do know what they're talking about. There's a, there's a difference, right? I don't want to have a rehash because somebody heard something on a podcast. But like you said, you know, if you have a medical problem and you're immunosuppressed, you're in more jeopardy than the next person, right? These so, are the people that should go to the hospital. Right. And, and running out and getting just the zinc or the vitamin C, whether how it's, it's not important. And so I want to touch base on something very important, which a lot of people don't really talk about, except for when they come to see you or me or other colleagues is, hey, you know what? Those vitamins and supplements, that can affect your medication. Yes. Right. So, you know, we can't have you on certain medications or certain supplements if you're taking blood thinners. Yeah. So if, if we're talking about something, let's stick to something like really simple. We know vitamin D is important yeah. and vitamin C is important. Mm -hmm. I'm taking my immunotone. I'm mm -hmm. taking my mushroom. We haven't even talked about mushroom yet. I'm excited to talk about mushroom. What comes to your mind that people take as, oh, it's just a vitamin, you know, vitamin A, C, D. And they're taking a certain medication. What medications pop into your head to say, "Hey, you know what? You shouldn't be taking this vitamin." Or at least, if you're going to sit with somebody like us, hmm. most of those I recommend. I, I put things out there that are really not going to interfere so much because there's. I've had people come in because they were they had issues with their liver functions and some issues with their hormones because they were taking crappy supplements. They were, t they had impurities in them that were affecting them. You know, it, it's just too vast to go through each and every supplement, but, but almost no one's going to be hurt by probiotic. Vitamin D is not, it's a fat soluble vitamin. Unless you, you know, you have liver failure, you're not going to accumulate that. Vitamin A is a short term thing. You know, nobody, I don't think people realize that they used high dose vitamin A and high dose vitamin D in third world countries that did not have antibiotics. And they work, they work for flus and viruses and bacteria, but I, nobody can say whether they're going to work for coronavirus. So most of those things are pretty harmless. Uh, and and same thing with NAC. Mushrooms are mushrooms are mostly fine. Medicinal mushrooms are different from other mushrooms. So some people that have gout or have issues with regular mushrooms may or may not have a problem with reishi mushroom. That's a mushroom that I usually recommend because it's anti it has some studies that show antiviral antibacterial antioxidant anti-inflammatory uh, so so gout could be a problem and if you're if you're taking too many mushrooms and there are mushroom blends but they're they've actually used reishi mushroom for gout so the always 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 safest to check with your doctor or the natural formulas database just to see if there are interactions. Because so some of the formulas have a long, long list of things and you'd have to look up each and every one of them. And you did say vitamin C for those, you know, high levels of vitamin C for those who have, you know, kidney stones, prone to kidney stones, you know, they're going to watch that high level vitamin C as well. Yeah. And the thing is, you also need to, if you're going to have uh, vitamin C, it's, if you're going to get kidney stones, it's usually from oxalates. Right. So low oxalate foods and have the, the counter is even though the kidney stones are often have to do with calcium, it's uh, with it oxalates. If you give calcium with the foods that have oxalates, it prevents kidney stones. So gotcha. even calcium with vitamin C may be helpful. Okay, excellent. And let's just touch a little bit more about mushroom. You know, you and I are both big fans of organo. Um, and then I use some other ones. I, I use a chaga, I use a powder reishi, a uh, lion's mane. Um, you know, talk a little bit about mushrooms. I was just reading an article last week talking about how mushrooms are actually forested, how it's grown, um, and how we need to be careful where we purchase mushroom product from 
because it could just be more of a starch than the actual mushroom. So can you touch base about that? Because mushrooms are so important for our immune system. They're excellent for our immune system. I'm not the mushroom expert. Sasha and probably right. you are a better expert than I am. And I'm very, very careful about, you know, I make sure that the source of what I recommend is a good source. Things found in nature are contaminated because nature is contaminated. And I don't really know that people realize that the foods you eat are, you know, a lot of them have arsenic, lead, cadmium in them. And that's why if you buy crap supplements, if you buy crap, crappy uh, herb, herbs and minerals are the ones that are most contaminated. And I'm not so sure about mushrooms. I, as I said, I, that's not something I've studied in depth. Maybe you might want to speak to that, but I will only recommend supplement companies that I know to be reputable where they test Right, so third party testing is, is super important. I, I can tell you when I take the mushroom product, I feel much more focused and I do have better energy. Um, I, I, I feel that way, I mean. That's what got me started on the Oregano. You know, is I, I could never have a cup of coffee in the afternoon, but I felt I, you know, I was working very, very long days and I would have that and I wouldn't get shaky. I mean, I would get like this if I had coffee. But no, I, don't, I feel really good and alert and focused. I have some people who are just so thrilled with the results of having that coffee. It's, it's less acidic. They don't get the stomach pain. They don't get the reflux. They, they, they get relief from a lot of aches and pains. I've had people whose rashes went away. I had somebody who had chronic fatigue and severe pain after being treated for Lyme and said they were after a week of having the coffee with the mushroom floors in it, it felt much better. So do you want to speak a little bit more about the mushrooms? I, I have the same experience you had. I mean, I just find that when I'm taking it, I am much more, you know, on, um, much, much more focused. And it feels different when I don't take it. Um, and reading more and more about mushrooms, you know, it's interesting some of the studies that are done with mushrooms and cancer. I find that absolutely interesting. It's totally think, fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're going to start seeing mushrooms with respect to neurodegenerative. I think that's going to come up next. I think we're going to see that next. I mean, I just, again, it's part of my, you know, my, my morning afternoon routine. I enjoy it. Um, with respect to coronavirus and additional steps I'm taking, you know, I'm hitting the immunotone from Designed for Health, um, my vitamin C, my D, uh, my zinc, um, my electrolytes, my branch chain amino acids. Um, I eat a ton of vegetables as it is. So we're still lucky. So we get to buy from our farms. So, you know, food plays an important role in this as well. You know, if there's any time to stop smoking, any time to get your obesity under control, let the coronavirus be your catalyst to, to, to motivate you to do this. I mean, totally. Now's the time to do it. I wanted to tell people a little bit about what I learned about the course of the illness in terms of spread. Excellent. And, uh, what I learned was, you know, there's things are being studied to death and, uh, you know, we're no pun intended, but they, they learn that the first five days is when you transmit the most virus. And that's when you don't have symptoms. Then the, then you, you, for the next 10 days, you may be symptomatic, but then even if you have virus left in your nasal passages, at that point, you're not spreading it to anyone. And this is, I think, where they came up with at least two weeks in isolation, gotcha. where many places are extending it because, say, you know, for example, I was spreading it for five days, and then I you know, the sixth day I developed symptoms and then my husband got it after three days and then for five days he's spreading it and so on and so forth. That's probably why we, we need a little bit longer uh, social distance period. So if, if you were doing okay on Monday, you start feeling lousy by Friday, Saturday, your two week self-imposed quarantine would be from that Saturday not from the Monday earlier? It's usually the Monday earlier, okay. but when you've been exposed to, it's got to start from the day of exposure. Right, but you may not know that. Right, and that's why it's, it's spreading like wildfire. Okay, so you that's know? a great explanation. Thank you for that. So yeah. I want to go through it again because I want to make sure I understand it so everybody else understands it. 
if I feel lousy on Monday, or I'm okay Monday, but I feel lousy on Saturday, the self-imposed quarantine goes from the Monday to two Mondays later, not from the Saturday to two Saturdays later. Yeah, I think as a precaution, people would do it from the Saturday just to be sure. Okay. But what they've learned is that the first five days, and you know, children don't seem to be affected. And Which they is fantastic. Be, it is fantastic, but they may be super spreaders. Good just point. because you don't have illness, remember, eighty percent are asymptomatic. Those eighty. That's why it's spreading so fast because. People are being smart and courteous about if they're not feeling well, they stay home. They don't go out and socialize. Well, if you don't know you have anything, just like this woman said, they were all at a party. Everybody was feeling good. She didn't feel anything right away, but it's those five days when you don't know what's going on and you don't feel anything that you could be spreading things. And this is really why Many states have called a state of emergency. Why some places are closing schools? Why workplaces are saying, why don't you just work from home unless you have to, to avoid crowds of over 250 people? Because it's obvious if you have symptoms, but when you don't have symptoms, you don't know if you're spreading it or not. Right. Well, one of the things I want to do before we, we wrap this up is talk about the stress of this event. Stress from the perspective, emotional, uh, stress financial on a lot of people as well. So I've been talking about people doing some yoga, talking, doing about some meditation. You can still go outside and walk. And now you should go outside and walk. It's a sunny day today back east. We're lucky. Um, what are your ideas? Any other ideas that we can do to get to stress under control and stop watching the news for love of God? Be, be you know, be knowledgeable, right. learn about it, but let's not repeat it i mean right i i do some of the i recommend some of the same things breathing meditation yoga tai chi laughing i you know i i watch saturday night live skits you know at night i black i do the uh twilight on my ipad and i just laugh i i i just get away from all this doom and gloom i make sure i'm up to date i read what i need to read i don't get emotionally latched onto it. Uh, it look, uh, people, I'm sure people has to look back at their resiliency. There's always been a time in your life when you've been hit hard physically, emotionally, or financially, and know that you got through it and you will get through it again. I mean, I suffered terribly in the crash in 2008. I had just been laid off from my job. I started a new business. I sunk everything I had into starting my practice and my God, the, then the markets crashed and nobody was coming. And it was, it was really hard, but I got through that. And then the markets were bad then and, and they went crazy up and more than recovered the losses. Everybody's got to find their own resilience and faith and look back to what you've done and what you've come through and look to others who can inspire you because you're you're not gonna get out of a hole with other people in the hole with you. Right. You're only gonna get out of the hole when somebody reaches in or you put your hand up to be pulled out. And focusing on what you can do, not what you can't do is going to help you a lot. Not focusing on the doom and gloom, just having the faith to know that you're going to be able to get through it and you're going to, you, you may not know how, you may not know when, but having the faith is going to make all the difference in the world. And you'd be surprised what comes out of that. I mean, I'm a big believer and, you know, I've had times in my life when I lost my faith and I stayed in a doom and gloom. And yet I've had times where I was, I had the faith to know that everything was going to work out. And you know what? It did. That's excellent. One wonderfully said. I want to end on that high note and just one more question. You know, how can people get in touch with you? HowToLiveYounger.com through my website. I have lots of information, lots of blogs. I have a, a private Facebook group called Vibrance for Life and a newsletter that you can sign up for on the website. People are actually asking for the newsletter now. Excellent. And uh, I'm, I even have a YouTube channel. Wonderful. Wonderful. So I super, super, really, really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. Um, 
and then you can hopefully share this with others as well. And we'll go from there. Thanks for inviting me because I think people need a little calm. Right. Calm is what we want to give today. Lend a sense of calm. And, and, and you really did that. I appreciate yeah, it. For reputable sources. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I really, really appreciate it. It was great.